Welcome everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about housing starts and stubborn mortgage rates. Logan, welcome back to the podcast on a pretty big day. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, you know, housing starts came out uh, this morning, and uh, I, I was hoping that it would be like the last decent report before the upward move in mortgage rates starts to filter into the data. Um, and it was kind of disappointing. And then, you know, uh, CNBC asked me to come on and 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 talk about that. And this is kind of the frustrating aspect of housing economics, but we also have to explain it in real terms. You know, I'm, I'm not going to kind of sugarcoat anything. I, it's, it's very hard for me to kind of forecast below 5.75 mortgage rates unless the labor market is deteriorating. And, and, and the theme was, you know, housing starts weren't that good and rates hadn't even been filtrated into the system. We're going to have some positive forward-looking data come into some of the reports, but now as rates gone up, you know, uh, we're still in, the Fed is still in restrictive policy for housing. And what I talked about on CNBC is that, I mean, I could only say, hey, listen, if we just get to 6% rates, we can do something here. But if we're always going to have this issue where rates go down and then pop right back up again, and then, you know, a few months, of really bad data, you know, that's that's restrictive policy. That's not a very pro housing growth policy. And maybe they should come out and say something like that. We have no policy agenda to grow housing or housing starts or any construction. And this is this is who we are. At least it might bring some clarity into the subject matter. But uh, I've tried everything I can, the Gandalf line, the Hordor line, trying to communicate it. But uh, it, it was a, it was a disappointing report. You know, and again, when you're when you stay restrictive too long, the history of economics always says that you affect the future production of what you need. Uh, uh, and it, it was so evident today uh, uh, in the data line. And all these people say, well, we're going to build millions of homes. And I was like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You cute little kids. You're not going to do that. So. I, it is really disappointing because it feels like we are just in this catch-22. Like, what is the solve from your perspective? Like, yes, you know, mortgage rates at 6%. What are the chances that the Fed has that same goal or even is even thinking about housing right now? You know, I, I, I wanted to explain it in this way because a, a few days ago, President Daly said, oh, there's some life in the housing market. And there could be some validity to that if mortgage rates just stay between six and a quarter and five point seven five. If it's if it's sub six percent heading lower, that's not a problem. That's the, we can grow sales, builders can, can build homes, construction can pick up. When the Fed funds rate starts to come down a little bit more, the cost of buying land and uh, five unit production gets easier. But it didn't, and I, I think what happens is that Feds do these presentations. And it might be like a week or 10 days before they actually talk. And it's just like rates had gone up. And what we've always seen in the data is r when rates jump right back up, especially heading back towards 7%, demand fades. This is like the third time now in, in, in two years. But realistically, the point I was trying to make on CMC, all you need is six and just stay there. And if you're not going to do that, at least tell the public, we do not believe in a pro-housing growth policy anymore. So um, because what the CNBC anchor said was 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 correct. Uh, it's confusing to the consumer because the consumer hears that, well, the growth rate of inflation has fallen. Uh, the labor market is softening, so we have to cut rates. And mortgage rates shoot right back up, you know, to 7%. So uh, – there, there comes a point to where I think the media has to hold all of them responsible for saying something uh, about this. They've been able to get away with this for so long because nobody calls them and they kind of make haphazard comments. But here it is, the production of housing, even on a report that shouldn't have had the increase in in, in mortgage rates in it, just shows it's just uh, uh, permits for five unit constructions or recessionary levels. Single family permits had a very little increase and I, I would have anticipated more because I didn't think the rate impact here. And here we are. Um, 
not a very pro growth kind of mindset uh, with this. And I, and I'm just being realistic to even to my own forecast, you just need to get down to a certain level and have it stick. You don't need 3%, 4%. I, I realize you're not going to get a booming housing market or anything like that, but it's something workable for the builders and consumers to start getting these things going. And they're just, yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. So what happens at the next Fed meeting? The next Fed meeting will be after the election, right? What happens at that? You, is you probably Fed. get a quarter. And again, a lot of things are kind of priced in, you know, uh, uh, over time with more rate cuts, you know, again, land purchases, uh, of five unit construction, the, the cost of doing something becomes less, uh, uh, but it's going to be a very slow process to get there. Uh, again, uh, for single family permits, if the labor market deteriorates, then rate, as we've seen, rates went almost down full 2% without any rate cuts, and then the economic data firm backed up. And uh, it, it's just that housing is in this, everything else is kind of functioning, but housing is just stuck. And you don't need to have, there's no point of having rates spike right back up uh, uh, in, in this. It, it, you got to move an economy and move it forward. And I think they've gotten away with it because no one challenges them. Like I wouldn't mind them just coming out there and just saying to the public, we just don't believe in a pro-housing policy for the United States. This was the whole COVID-19 housing economic policy that I've talked about with the Fed for the last two years. Uh, but if they say it to the public, then the consumers won't be so confused because Trust, no matter how much I talk about the slow dance with a 10-year right. yield of mortgage rates, the mortgage spreads or anything, the general consumer that's looking to either sell to buy or buy, you know, they, they just see headlines, oh, we've made progress on inflation, the labor market's getting softer, we're cutting rates more than anticipated, and mortgage rates shoot up almost 1%. So it's just, it, it, the CNBC anchor is correct. It's, it's confusing uh, uh, consumers. And this is not like you're buying an app or a dress for a party on a weekend. This is like a huge you know, purchase for your life and how you're gonna live your life and what you're gonna do. And uh, uh, it, it's just this last piece in the puzzle. It's just, you know, it, I, I'll be honest with you. If the 10 year yield just ranged between 3.37 and 3.8 and we had normal spreads, I'm pretty sure every bearish person I know would just be like throwing in the flag because you know then housing would pick up and that's the, that's the one thing everyone's counting on. Everyone's counting on housing starts falling, permits falling, residential construction workers lose their jobs, and that's every cycle that we've seen go into recession. So they're hoping the Fed keeps raising rates. They're wanted, you know. Uh, the clever ones are saying, "Oh my God, look, the economy is growing at three percent. They have to raise rates even you know." <clears throat> You know, it's frustrating, but this is the world we live in. And we can't say things that you guys want to hear just to make it you know, okay or venting or feeling better or, yeah, mortgage rates are going to go down to five percent. I mean, how many people have talked about mortgage rates are going to go lower, lower, lower for two, three years? It hasn't happened. There are certain things that need to occur and we're, we're still not there yet. So that's the frustrating aspect when I see a housing starts report with permits this low and everybody talks about we're going to build millions of homes and no you're not it's yep. just not the, how it works so i think the interesting thing is it's frustrating all the way up right that's why we've seen different presidential uh campaigns the harris campaign saying to your point like she's going to build three million more houses and there's at the federal level there is just not that much they can do to incentivize housing, as, except for like what they're what what she's already proposed, what maybe Trump is planning for, like you know, incentivizing builders. But there's just it's it's more complicated than that. You could throw all the incentives in the world if they cannot sell the product at a certain profit. Why, Sarah? Because well, they're not the March of Dimes. They're not the March of Dimes. It, it has to make financial sense. And this has actually been a, something for me in the last decade. You know, in the last decade, my whole theme was we're going to have the weakest housing recovery ever. We're never going to have 1.5 million starts this decade. You know, that was from 2010 to 2019. Saying that, and, you know, and people are going, oh, that's crazy. Housing starts are so low. And said, you know, we're never going to have the demand that warrants that kind of building. Worked the entire decade. You know, 10 years, we never had housing starts get to 1.5 million because 
We simply didn't have demand. New home sales missed estimates in 2013, 14, 15. They had a supply spike in 2018. You have to work your demand curve up. Now, what's occurred now is that the builders advantage, disadvantage. The builders have the ability to pay down rates to get sub 6%. Think about this. The builders are like the pro housing, you know, not the uh, Federal Reserve. So imagine if the builders didn't have gross profit margins over 20% and they couldn't do this. And right. we're even lower right now. And the Fed just sits there and goes, well, we, we, we need confidence. So it's just, it's frustrating because you, you know me, a, a, a growing economy, people have sex, they have kids, they build homes. They, that's what it's, well, that's how it's worked. And this last batch of just, you know, uh, not making kind of any commitment is all waiting for the labor market to get weaker. And then they go, okay, right. now we could be a little bit more uh, uh, aggressive, but it's just painfully slow. Uh, uh, and after watching that report, I'm like, great, you know, this is, this is our reality. I'm just trying to convey that to the consumers, to the public people, even, uh, uh, advocacies of housing starts. This is, you're not getting your extra 3 million housing starts here. Uh, whoever the president is can eke out 3 million housing starts, uh, within a four year period, unless rates go to like 10%. Uh, that's not it. If you're trying to build more than the demand curve, you're going to need still demand to pick up. And that's that's the frustrating aspect. And this is something I've been dealing with for like what, the third, this is year 14 now of trying to explain this. So let's talk about Fed rate cuts, because we know some of them have already been priced in. But how many at what point do the Fed rate cuts actually mean a rate cut? So when the 10 year yield gets below 380, then we bring Hordor out. A lot has been priced in. So mortgage rates, I, there's a reason why I don't forecast below 5.75 because I'm assuming kind of a neutral policy. Uh, so uh, when we get down to those levels with rates, it's all kind of priced in at that point. Um, so explain that I, to me, like, what does that mean? Like, I don't understand what that means. Like, is that the, at, you know, by the end of the year, we're finally uh, doing cuts that next, haven't been I would say the in? next six rate cuts are already priced in when the 10-year oh, yield is below 380. So, yeah. Is, so when, the, when, the, when mortgage terrible. rates are near 6% or 5.75, it, it's, it's kind of all priced in. This is why I created the hoarder line. I was like, guys, this really just, I mean, really does, it takes a lot. And I think this is the comp complicated aspect. So I try to like keep it simple. Just remember when we're below 380 on the 10 year yield and mortgage rates are at 6%, a lot has been priced in because Fed is still restrictive. Now, of course, the spreads can get better, right? Over time, that'll be a positive. That could get mortgage rates lower. Or the Fed just basically says, listen, Logan thinks we're a bunch of sissies. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to we're going to have to like grow the economy. We're a bunch of old people and we don't, you know, we, we, we're, it just doesn't matter much to us. And this is why I always think it's good to have younger people into the mix that when you have too many baby boomers in one institution, there's there's a sense of uh, a, a disconnect from society. And what do people what do people on housing costs are so much? So let's make policy so restrictive that we don't build a lot of homes. That's our answer for everything. And it's just like, it's, it's one of the more frustrating things to see in the last, I would say, eight to 12 months. But it's also a reality of knowing who I'm going up against. And um, uh, no, this is why we, 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 we created the paper rock scissors game just to kind of make sense of all but the labor data as we all see what happened yep. right jobs reports beats 10-year yield went up jobless claims beat 10-year yield went up the funny thing is like you know the crazy crash people whenever the 10-year yield goes up they go oh, it's inflation right it's not the economic data getting better these guys um the labor data got better the economic data firm were up so it's just Housing is just in this very awkward spot. And, and this is, I'm not sitting here advocating for three or four or 5% mortgage rates, but just get down to six and get something going because it just, it's so slow. And we're already, we look at housing permits and starts. There's nothing going on here. And this is like year two now. So, uh, and if rates keep on going higher then the single family permits fall, and then we're just wasting time. Right. Every day we are all closer to death. 
right? <laughs> Time does not care. So you want to get things going again. And uh, I'd rather just see mortgage rates get to 6% than to do kind of a demand stimulus tax credit first, you know, something like that and let the marketplace kind of work itself. We are doing a disadvantage uh, uh, to us. It's kind of like when I think of the Fed, sometimes I think of what the Chinese government says, my God, if the US ever fixed its immigration system and stem and got all these really smart people around the world to come in there and stay in there for a very long time, God, we're screwed. Right. And I always think about the Federal Reserve, God, we need more housing starts, but the Federal Reserve bring rates lower and all of a sudden we build more homes. Oh my God, that'll be a positive. But the Fed's like, no, 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 we can't do that yet. So it's it's frustrating. And I just like, I was hoping at least this report had some kind of benefit until the rates hit it and it really didn't. The one positive aspect about this Housing Starts report is that the units being completed, right, is picking up just because of the backlog. We have all this backlog of homes. It took a while, but now the completions are kicking in. Once that's done, permits are at recession lows for five years. By the time you ramp this stuff up again, it's going to take too long. Uh, and it just, that's, that's why we don't like slow people, man. We just do not like slow people on this. No, we don't. Um, so, you know, you and I have talked a lot about how the labor market is softening, but it's not breaking yet. Um, ahead of the next jobs report, what would show which way we're going there? I mean, do you do you can do you think? Oh, you know, it's it's probably still softening, but we're just not going to see a break for a while. Okay, so there's two reports outside of the Jobs Friday reports that really matter. The number one, of course, always jobless claims. Okay, okay. what happened this last week? Jobless claims fell, and the ten year yield went up. Uh, um, if job if jobless claims ticks up consistently and gets to that. This is why we created that 323,000. They said, do not go into the recession camp until you see jobless claims going up there. That's kind of how it's worked since the Peloponnesian War. Now, the jobs softening, the job, op- I think the job openings data confuses a lot of people. The, the yeah. Federal Reserve, it, it's actually a very effective data line, but it's a data line that not a lot of people like. Uh, it's softening in a sense, we don't have 12 million job openings anymore. We have near 8 million. It was 7 million before COVID, but the internals of the job openings show a little bit more deterioration in terms of we're not hiring a lot of people, right? And you always want to take a trend. You want to take kind of a trend of job growth, not one or two reports, whether positive or negative. So it's softening, but breaking means layoffs, right? Mm -hmm. Jobless claims rise, people fall for unemployment. That's how economic cycles work. You can't just like change the rules just because you you want something to to show something when it happens it breaks and the claims rise and this is why i always say you want to focus on residential construction workers manufacturing jobs uh the lack of investment we're starting to see more fed people talk about this that you know there's just not a lot of business investment now because rates are high and, and hopefully i'm i'm hoping that 2025 will be the year they finally just cross over uh, uh, into the, okay, we need to be a little bit more uh, uh, friendly to get more domestic investment going. And uh, that's that's what I'm hoping for. I don't like to have like a hope model, but with a progression of where the labor market inflation is, that would be the next stage. That's more probably a 2025 storyline. And I just like 6% will get, you, will get you something, but you can't just go down 6% and shoot right back up. Now, the one positive that I've always tried to highlight what is it, Sarah? Can you guess? There's one <laughs> no. Fed member who isn't crying. What? Neil Kashkari has not come out and cried. <laughs> oh, oh my God, people are buying homes and having sex. How are we supposed to keep inflation down? We want, you know, see, inflation, growing economies are inflationary because they're right. grow. Wages grow, prices grow. This is, you know, deflationary. Too small. You know- it doesn't work. It's not a good thing, right? That's not a good economy. Deflation is bad, right? Uh, this is why you in, inflation is always rising post World War II. I do these World War II charts. I actually go all the way back to 1870 on the CPI. It's like post World War II, we're not a deflationary economy. The economy is growing. There's deficit spending going on. Wages grow, population growth. You know, these things are all part of a growing. We are the only economic superpower left in America or not in America, but in the entire world. So 
Um, but you got to get to you got to get through these little stages, and I think hopefully 2025 will be more positive in that light. Okay, first of all, there's no way I would have guessed that the positive, the silver lining was that one of the Fed presidents wasn't out there crying. That that no, that's it, it, it had it's oh, it's oh, if Neil is not crying, that means it's a good thing. <laughs> that means internally, you know, they're not uh, uh, they're not you know too too hawkish in the sense where where literally remember the, I don't know if you if people remember this but literally Neil Kashkari came on TV when mortgage rates were heading down towards 6% in 2023 and you just got a little bit of demand like a little bit of so just like oh, it's just showing signs of life they they keep on saying signs of life this guy all fed presidents say that i think that's a that's a fed president thing and i was like it's just like a few weeks of positive day how are we supposed to rebalance the economy it's like, no, go back to the mummy. <laughs> go back to that movie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, it's a great point. I'm glad that you're picking out some silver linings for our listeners because, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of a tough time. We all thought uh, again, you know, I feel like we've been psyched out several times about like you when are things going to You keep on saying we all thought, Sarah Wheeler. Not all of us. I, I'm no, telling you, right. I did that's not. Right. I do not create Hordor. Out of thin air. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a complicated, listen, I understand. It's a complicated thing with the Fed funds rate, where neutral rate is, where the 10 year, we are so accustomed to low mortgage rates after 2010, that this is all new to us. And we made, we talked about that in the last podcast that people are just, and, and the CNBC producer was like, yeah, everyone was thinking rates are going to go down, not, not go back up to near 7%. I mean, that's not, you know, that wasn't part of it. And I just like, yeah, the Fed's still restrictive uh, out there, and and eventually, it once those units are completed, and then you sit there and you're like, oh my god, permits are at recession levels, and then you look at Kashkar and go, hey Neil, how about this? Uh, uh, I'm not a voting member, you know, so it's just we just want to get them to move, just move along. It's like the one. Ahead. It's like the one thing. If this, if literally this change, I think a lot of bearish people just go, okay, all right, all right. The economy is expanding. If they're all holding their hats on housing, creating the recession, which per economic cycles, they are correct. Uh, we're not quite there on either side of the table. So we're kind of stuck here right here. And it's frustrating. Oh, frustrating. It is frustrating. Well, thanks for being on. I will note that um, we crossed a million downloads this year for this podcast, um, I think yesterday. So that is kind of yes, a big for us. Thank you all. Um, we did not expect a company of our size, you know, especially going against the Bloombergs and the Wall Street Journals, which have very big budgets, you know, bigger companies for us to be kind of in a top 10 business podcast. And uh we enjoy the fans and we are helping people work out because do you know how many people say, oh, I listen to you guys when I work out or I listen to you guys when we run. <laughs> it's and true. and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been so much fun. I, I have to tell you, uh, going on the Neuro Tour and, and meeting fans and talking and asking questions and uh, getting part of the Instagram family where we have, you know, over 20,000 people that are just primarily real estate and, and mortgage and, and trying to teach this stuff and, and getting the feedback. That's, that's the best aspect for me because the, the old high school basketball coach and the old historian here, you know, teaching and having your students learn and having them progress forward, either as a young basketball player or coach and seeing them develop or as a student, you know, in teaching history, it's, it's always, it's always the, the, the best feeling when people learn. So we just got to get a few Fed presidents to learn. And then we're we do, we do. We know they listen because uh, we, we see it on the, sometimes in the, in the things that they say, they pick up things. So uh, if you're a Fed president out there, listen uh, yeah, to Logan. Fed staffers, please. Again, we're doing this again. <laughs> we, we said this last year, do not put signs of life in the housing data uh, speeches Unless you get at least twelve months of positive purchase application, it just it makes your presidents look like out of touch, right? It's in, it get, when rates get lower and stay lower, and purchase application data grows every week. And my God, we're working for the lowest levels ever. It should be able to grow every single week on a year over year basis. When that happens, give it some time and duration, then write it down. But don't put it in the speech. Rip it up. Rip it up. Delete it. Take what was those things back in the days in the eighties? You take like an ink and you. 
You white. What are those things called? You remember where you used to about? white out something? Oh yeah, it was white, white out. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was just white, white out. out. Yeah. Oh my god, the kids have no idea what we're talking about. That's what we used to do <laughs> back in the days. So we would basically get like a thing, and it's like nail it, polish. Even and even on a typewriter, you would do write out, uh, white out on a typewriter. Yeah. Oh, Crazy. we're old, Sarah. Uh, I know, and I'm the, older than you, as you love to point out. The kids just have so. probably no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for being on today. Thank you for always guiding us in the right place. And I wish we had better news. We will we will keep a lookout on all these things. And by the time this uh, podcast comes out, the new tracker will come out. And also, uh, maybe maybe I, I, the history of fantasy football that, you know, uh, uh, there's always that oh, no. really bad team that has one really great week and the really oh, good team has a really bad week. We are going head to head this you week. You could possibly, possibly beat me, you know. So that'll be a positive. We will see. (laughs) That'll be a positive. All right. Thanks, Logan. 